do also the same for them. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets. And with this translation in mind, uh, we looked at a list of things that we should do for others because we would want them to do these things for us. Uh, and that list, um, in, in no particular order, number one was to demonstrate love. We, we all want love uh, for ourselves, and we should demonstrate love, uh, both brotherly love and agape love, which is sacrificially meeting people's needs. <clears throat> you know, First um, Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 22 that we looked at last week says this, see that you have sincere love for your brothers, Love deeply from the heart. And Jesus said this to his disciples, love one another, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Number two on our list was to show honor and respect. We, we all want honor and respect. Uh, First Peter 2.17 says, show proper respect to everyone. And Romans 12.10, uh, as we looked at last week, says, honor one another above yourselves. Number three on our list was give forgiveness. I know I need forgiveness and I know I, I should forgive others because I want them to forgive me. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And number four on our list was help people who are in need. Um, we all need a helping hand from time to time. I know I have and when I've been in uh, difficult situations, uh, Romans 12, 13 says, share with God's people who are in need. We should share our time. We should share encouragement. We should share resources uh, with people who are in need. <clears throat> Number five was tell the truth. We all want people to tell us the truth, and we should do that for other people also. We saw that in Ephesians 4, 25, it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbors, for we are all members of one body. Number six was encourage and exhort. I certainly appreciate the encouragement that, that I got just from that uh, introduction, Robert. I appreciate that. That's an encouragement to me. And we need to uh, be exhorted also. The word exhort there really means encouraging people to do what's right. You know, Hebrews uh, 313 we saw last week says, but encourage and exhort one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sins and deceitfulness. And uh, number seven on our list was pray earnestly. Uh, Ephesians 618 says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests and always keep on praying for all the saints. You know, the golden rule tells us that we should do these seven things for others because we want people to do them for us. But as we've just seen, we should also do all of these seven things because the Bible specifically tells us that we are to do them. And then last week, we, we saw that there is still another reason why we should do these seven things for others. And that reason is because Jesus did each and every one of those seven things for us. And before he left, he told his disciples in John 13, 15, I have set an example for you that you do for one another the things that I have done for you. It's really another way of saying the golden rule. We are to do for others the things that we would want others to do for us. But Jesus said also, I've set an example that you do for one another the things that I have done for you. <clears throat> okay. It brings us to today, and we're going to pick up in the next two verses um, in, of Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Now, it, as you'll probably notice now from, from here all the way to the end of chapter 7, Jesus is going to compare and contrast two gates, two paths, two destination, two groups, two kinds of prophets, two kinds of participants in the kingdom, two kinds of builders and two different foundations. And all of these compares and contrasts, these are all there where they, Jesus gave all these to make a distinction as clear as possible between a way of living that leads to destruction and death and a way of life that leads to rewards and life. So 
the golden rule in verse 12 that we looked at last week was the command of Christ number 18 in our little booklet. And in the very next verse is command number 19 in our booklet, which is choose the narrow way. So let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says this, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So here, Jesus is using the symbolism of a gate and a road to describe a choice between two ways of life. You know, as we think about this, you know, this choice is absolutely critical for lost people because God gives people the choice to reject the gospel and lead that life that leads to destruction or that they can accept God's gift of salvation and live a life that leads to eternal life with God. We need to note, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this concept, that every person starts out on the road to destruction when they are born. God gives them the choice to move on to the narrow road by accepting Jesus as their salvation. So also <clears throat> keep in mind that this Sermon on the Mount here, this is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is part of it in chapter 7. This was addressed to whom? Remember, it was addressed primarily to Jesus' disciples and to us who are his disciples today. Because of this command, each of us have a choice, have choices every day that we can, and we have choices that can tempt us that we might want to veer off the straight and narrow way of God and take that broad way of sin. And unfortunately, and to our benefit, maybe Jesus calls that path, the path to destruction. And when he was talking to his disciples and to us, he's saying that narrow path is going to lead to destruction. And the truth is sin in our lives that can destroy our life. It can destroy the life of our family and it can destroy the life of the people all around us. It can even destroy a church when a Christian veers off the narrow way that God is telling us to be on. <clears throat> you know, unfortunately, the majority of the people in the world today choose the, the way of destruction. And some Christians will veer off the narrow path onto the, uh, the sinful path. So let's look at some reasons why. We're going to look at several reasons. These are not necessarily in ranked order. Why do path? And why do lost people choose to reject the salvation? Okay, one reason is fear of being ridiculed. You know, this is, I, I've, in my experience, I've found this is probably especially true for our young people in schools today. Uh, you know, 2 Peter 2 verses 1 and 2 says, There will be false teachers among you speaking evil of the way of truth. You know, Christians today are often ridiculed by teachers in our schools as being ignorant or narrow-minded. Um, you know, I talk to my, my oldest daughter teaches British literature at the University of Houston. She has to be very careful with what she says about Christianity, because not only could she We've lost David. David, I think you're frozen there, buddy. You're frozen in time. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was looking at the screen. I said, well, maybe it's just my computer. But then I saw everybody else moving, and, and David was the only one not moving. So, uh, well, I could play the introduction song while we wait. <laughs> uh, well, this is one we hadn't oh, seen before. Great. Hey, David, if you can hear me, you, whoop, we lost, he's, re, he's signing back in. So let me get ready to let him in the room here. Give me a second. Okay. I hope everybody saw the message today, but uh, Liberant Abraham announced that he's going to a church near in Carrollton, Texas, just by Dallas in the 1st of March. Yeah, the name of the church is, I think it's Bent Tree. Bent Tree. And I thought, well, that's an interesting name for a church. 
So, well, he's not signed back in yet. Let's see. Entry Bible Fellowship or something like that. Can you that. hear me now? It can hear you. I just don't see you. Where are you? Ah, okay. Oh, there you are. I see you now. Okay, there you are. <laughs> okay. All right. I changed to uh, another uh, another router. I have I have two different incoming uh, routers. So, uh, okay. so anyway, switched well, and we'll see if this one works better. Hey, just to um, let you know, quick thing, real quick. Uh, I should I was going to say this right before you came back on. Is that uh, this is for Carolyn? There's actually another prayer request in the chat section. Uh, and it's from Jonathan, and and uh, so if you could look at that one, Carolyn, whenever whenever you get a second. All right, sorry about that. Go ahead, okay. Dave. Okay. All right. So we're we're looking at at uh, reasons why um, people choose to be on the uh, wide road that leads to destruction, and the number one on the list was fear of ridicule. Uh, we talked about. Uh, people we're being we as Christians are often ridiculed but the good news is that when we are ridiculed we can rejoice because it confirms that we have chosen the correct path uh, you know Matthew 5 11 and 12 Jesus was he, he gave this he said blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven or in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you so yeah people sometimes christians don't like the persecution and uh, and will veer off and and uh, you know bend their their principles to keep from being persecuted but the bible tells us that that uh, being we should rejoice when we're persecuted because it is confirmation that we're on the right path. The second reason is uh, people veer off the right path is the pleasures of sin. You know, let's all be honest, there are pleasures in sin, <clears throat> but they only last for a short while. And then usually there is guilt and remorse and grief after that. And if we continue on the wrong path, we will damage our relationship with our Lord and we'll lose our joy and our peace and our blessings if we continue that way. You know, Solomon um, said it this way. Um, he said, for a person's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his path. The evil deeds of a wicked person ensnares him. <clears throat> the cords of his sin hold him fast. You know, sin can become a stronghold and an addiction in, in the life of a Christian. And uh, Solomon goes on to say he will be destroyed for a lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. You know, the people who are ridiculing us are, are foolish. Uh, their life will be destroyed. It says that this person who is led astray is destroyed by lack of self-discipline. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, in, it's also called self-control when it's listed in the fruit of the spirit, right? Uh, it's one of those... Uh, characteristics that each of us should exhibit as a Christian. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, you know the list, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and the last one is what? Self-control, right? So even though it's last on the list, it's a very important one <clears throat> because we're, when we are tempted by sin, when I am tempted by sin, I have, I have a note to myself here when i am tempted by sin i need to remember that my ways are in full view proverbs you know <clears throat> i have another note that i wrote here when i was when i was writing this the, the, the notes um for this lesson uh, i was reminded of the hymn trust and obey so I'm going, to, I'm going to read the words of this, of the hymn. You're, you're all familiar probably with the hymn, Trust and Obey. It says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. There's that word way again, the path, the road. When the, What glory he sheds on our way. He, he sheds glory on our life when we stay on the right path. While we do his goodwill, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. And then the last verse says this, when in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet 
or will walk by his side in the way. There's that word. Hey, David, you're breaking up big time, buddy. David. Oh. By sin. Yes. Yeah, you're breaking up big time. Okay, let me switch. Yeah, David, your signal level has gone way down. We just have to trust and obey that uh, we'll get this thing got going here. I was looking. I was looking for uh, Carlos Puig. There's no Car Carlos Puig today. We could do uh, one of his uh, mu musician jokes. <laughs> I think your microphone's turned off now, David. Got it. Okay, that's that's good. Okay, I switched again. We'll see if this one works better. Okay, where was I? Did we get to the last uh, the last stanza of trust and obey? No. Okay, all right. Okay, here we go. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way, talking about the narrow way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. You know, when our when our ways are in full view of the Lord, I was thinking of this, you know, when you're tempted to uh, you know, picture Jesus walking by your side and, and you saying to Jesus, let's, let's get off this narrow path for a while and take the broad path and have a little fun. You know, <laughs> that's kind of the way I picture it. You know, we're supposed to be walking along. He's walking with us in our way. And, uh, and, he, and all of our ways are in full view of him. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Okay. Get back to, okay. <clears throat> so in this command, Jesus is telling us to choose the narrow path in life. So each of us have choices to make every day to either obey God or to enjoy the pleasures of sin just for a short time. You know, Moses had this same choice in his life. Uh, in Hebrews 24, Hebrews 11, verse 24 says this, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward, uh, looking ahead to his reward. <clears throat> okay, a third reason people choose to get off the narrow path is our natural inclinations and the natural way we view the world. You know, uh, even though we are saved, we, we still all have an old sin nature that we constantly have to deal with. And because of this, the things that we naturally want to do seem right to us at times. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to destruction. You know, it seems right to people that if they do their best they can and, and do more goods than bad deeds, that they can earn their way to heaven. It, it seems right to look out for number one. It seems right to chase our dreams. But these things seem right, but they are on the path that leads to destruction and death. And, and uh, you know, that verse that we just read, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a person, but, the, but in the end, it leads to death. That verse is so important that God repeated it again two, two chapters later in the book of Proverbs. He repeated it again, word for word. You know, our, our natural inclinations seem right to us, but often they are directly opposite of God's way. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says it this way, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Our inclinations 
of our old sin nature also seem right because the vast majority of the people are on the wide path that leads to destruction. And they are constantly telling us that our natural inclinations are normal and acceptable, right? All the advertisements, all the TVs, all the movies, all the, the, the multitude on the, on the wide path are telling us, oh, that's all right, that's acceptable. You know, Proverbs 26, 12 says, a fool is wise in his own eyes. These people are fools. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. So if the wisdom of the world is foolishness, it means that we've got to search God's word for true wisdom that will keep us off, or keep us on the, the wide path that leads, keep us off the wide path that leads to destruction and on that path that leads to life. <clears throat> Uh, keep in mind also that when we're talking about this, the, that narrow path leads to both eternal life and to abundant life of joy and peace and blessing. So as Christians, we want to stay on the straight and narrow. Otherwise, we'll, we'll sacrifice joy and peace and blessings in our lives. Here's note, another note, too. Um, <clears throat> in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. So if the way to stay on the narrow way is to follow and obey, follow Jesus and obey his commands, right? Okay, so let, let's look at how Jesus compared and contrasted the way of death and the, and the path of, of life. Um, so number one, um, the path that leads to destruction is a wide path, right? It says, uh, Matthew 7, 13 says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Now, this, this road, this wide path that Jesus is talking about, this path that leads to destruction, it, it allows for great diversity of philosophies and opinions and evil practices, right? Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And, you know, your opinion is just as, their opinion is just as good and as valid as, as, as our opinion or your opinion. So, you know, wide diversity of philosophies, opinions, if it feels good, do it. <clears throat> In contrast to this, the path to life is narrow, Jesus said. 714, Matthew 714 says, narrow is the path that leads to life. You know, Christ's commands and his instructions to us are clear and precise, and they don't allow much tolerance for error. <clears throat> you know, Christians are often accused of being narrow-minded. In this case, we are, because in this case, Jesus was narrow-minded, because the road that leads to abundant life and eternal life is narrow. So, um, number two, let's compare and contrast. Um, the path to destruction is crowded. Uh, Matthew 7, 13 says, many are they that enter through it. Um, you know, multitudes are traveling this road. And the, that crowd, this crowd, this multitude is, is made up both by people who hate God, but also many who are very religious are on the wide path to destruction also. And in contrast to that, the path of life is not crowded. Matthew 7, 14 says, few are they that find it. You know, the, the truth is the, the path of life is followed by those who know how to stand alone. You know, when I, when I read that in the commentary, I, I had to make a note of that. The path that is not crowded, the path to life is, is followed by those who know how to stand alone. You know, 1 Kings 19, 14, Elijah said this, I am the only one left and now they are trying to kill me. And by the way, my, uh, my new grandson is named Elijah, and uh, I hope he'll be one who, who knows, learns how to stand alone. In Acts 5.29, Peter stood against the evil government of the Sanhedrin in Israel, and he said, we must obey God rather than men. You know, Daniel stood, stood alone against an entire empire, and he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. <clears throat> you know, as a personal note, as I wrote these words, I felt God was asking me, David, are you prepared to stand alone to follow me? 
Wow, I had to think about that one a bit. And I, that's, that's a question that God may be asking each one of us today. Are we prepared to stand alone to be able to stay on the straight and narrow path that Jesus wants us to take? A third thing to compare and contrast is that the path of destruction is the way of the ungodly. Um, you know, in this great multitude that's fallen this past, even those who, those who disagree with extreme wickedness defend their own level of immorality <laughs> because they use the world standards to judge what is wicked or immoral. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. In contrast to that, the path to life is the way of wisdom. Proverbs 4.11 says, I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along the straight paths. There's that word paths again. <clears throat> so our life is the, is the choices we make, the paths that we take. You know, again, my definition of wisdom is applying biblical principles to life circumstances. That always seems to work for me. David said this in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and the light for my path. There's that word again, a light for my path. He was talking about the life that he was living. <clears throat> we study God's word to gain wisdom to face the challenges. And that wisdom keeps us on the straight path of life. Um, you know, in, in the pastor's sermon today, if you caught that, he said he was going through a very difficult time in his life. And as he was reading God's word, he came across a verse of scripture um, in, a, in Isaiah that he said, I'd read that, that verse many times, but he said that that verse just reached out and touched his heart in that difficult time that he was going, going through. And he said it had, a, had an impact on his life during this difficult time. This verse was uh, Isaiah 30, 15, if you want to look it up. But I don't know if you've had that. I've, I've had that situation in my life also. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm reading God's word uh, and, and facing a problem in my life, a verse of scripture will just leap off the page and, and just guide me through with the wisdom of that verse, guide me through what I'm going to we study. God's word to gain wisdom, to face life's challenges, and that wisdom keeps us on the straight path of life. A fourth thing to compare and contrast, the road to destruction may provide prosperity, but it adds sorrow with it. David said this in Psalm 73, I envied the ungodly when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have more than heart could wish then I entered the sanctuary of God and I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to destruction. And in contrast to this, the, the road to life is the way of righteousness. Proverbs 8.20 says, I lead in the path of righteousness. And Proverbs 12.28 says, the path of righteousness is life. And in this path, there is no death. <clears throat> you know, the truth of those verses is if we let him, God will lead us in the paths of righteousness that leads to eternal life and leads to abundant life of joy and peace and blessings. Number five, another thing to compare and contrast, the last one, the road to destruction is a path of darkness. Proverbs 419 says, the way of the wicked is darkness. They don't know why they stumble. This is a sad fact that that most people, or I'll put it this way, lost people don't understand that many of their problems and probably most of their problems are the consequences of their decision to reject God. The way of the wicked is darkness. They don't know why they stumble, Solomon said. In contrast to this, the path of life that follows the steps of Christ, it's, it's, Psalms put the 85, 13, David said it this way, righteousness shall go before him and he shall set us set us in the way of his steps so the path of life follows the steps of christ jesus said in john 10 27 28 my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me 
and I give them eternal life. <clears throat> so we've read the command. <laughs> we've compared and contrasted the two ways of living. So now here are five suggestions on how to be able to walk in the way of life. So five suggestions. Number one, ask God to show you his way. David prayed this in Psalms 27, 11. He said, teach me thy way, O Lord. There's that word again, right? The way, way of life. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the, a plain path. There's that word again, because of my enemy. David knew that he needed to pray for God to teach him and guide him in the straight and narrow way. <clears throat> And it's, it's, of course, I'll repeat this, but it's been my experience that God teaches and leads me through his instructions in my Bible. Uh, number two, choose to follow Christ. You know, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. And in, in uh, John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. We have choices to make day by day, minute by minute sometimes. We have a choice. We can follow Jesus or we can not follow Jesus. And he said, he that follows me shall not walk in darkness. Number four of a way that helps us to stay on the straight and narrow is yield your rights to God. You know, the character quality of meekness requires that we yield our rights and expectations to God. And Psalms 25, 9 says, the Lord will guide in judgment and he will teach his ways to the meek. And then number five, last one, choose to die to yourself. You know, each day, each one of us, each day and each hour, we have a choice to live in a way that is either selfish or selfless. In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus said, whoever will save his life will lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. You know, it's been my experience when I choose to live a life that's selfless. I find the abundant life of joy that Jesus promised me. So in summary, five suggestions of how to stay on the straight and narrow, how to follow the path that, that Jesus wants to is ask God, choose to follow, listen to your conscience, yield your rights, die to self. That's how to follow the straight and narrow way of life. Okay, um, as we as we end the the lesson, uh, I was reminded that I was as I was teaching the lesson of the uh, of the poem by Robert Frost. The, the poem is the uh, the road not taken. You're probably all familiar with it, and in that poem, it's it it contains these words. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. You know, I, I, he, I hope each one of you here has taken that road less traveled by, because I know for me, like for Robert Frost, it has made all the difference in my life. So let's pray, and then we can open it up for some questions if you like. Dear Lord, Father God, we thank you for your salvation that you gave us, that gave us the privilege of following you along the narrow path of blessings, Lord. Father, we just ask that you would help us with the choices that we make every day to choose to follow you on the straight and narrow path. Lord, help us to remember to ask you for your guidance and direction every day and to read your word, to receive those instructions. Lord, help us to listen to the Holy Spirit as he pricks our conscience when we veer off your path. Help us to yield our rights and die to self and choose to live selflessly and not selfishly, Lord. I pray all of these things in your name, Father. Amen. Okay. Any comments? Robert, you want to unmute? Yes, I was going to say, be careful what you ask for. Okay, there's, <laughs> there's Henry's unmuted there. I just want to say it was a great lesson, David. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And uh, give me a call and I'll help you out on your wireless. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, it's a it's a quiet group. Quiet group. <laughs> hey. I'll, I'll throw in something else. 
Go ahead. Uh, you know, you're in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. You just don't think about this stuff very much. And I've thought many times, if I knew back then what I know now about God and Jesus and the Bible, I'd probably do some things a lot differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I would have had a Sunday school teacher that taught me these things when I was much younger. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think uh, Christian's unmuted there. Christian, you want to go ahead? Yes, I have a question. So as to get my priority, priorities right. <laughs> in in Jesus' agenda and priorities, did he save people before healing them? Or he healed them? And uh, if they kept following him, then he saved them. Good question. <laughs> yes.